When World War II broke out, the German fleet was small and weak, especially when compared to the mighty British Navy which ruled the Seven Seas. In particular, the German submarine fleet was a mere shadow of what it once was in the First World War. But under the leadership of Admiral Karl Dönitz, the German U-boats became a mighty force that terrorized British merchant ships. In July of 1940 alone, the U-boats sunk merchant vessels with a combined weight of over 230,000 tons. The U-boats' wolf pack attacks threatened to cut off supplies of food and fuel to the British Isles. In 1941, the British and Canadian navies managed, with great effort, to turn the tide and curb the U-boats' threat in the North Atlantic. But Dunitz skillfully diverted the U-boats' deadly potential to the eastern and middle parts of the Atlantic where the U-boat's commanders exploited the American Navy's lack of anti-submarine warfare experience, as well as the air gap in patrol aircraft coverage. By 1943, Germany had about 350 U-boats in active service, and in March of that year, Dunitz crews sunk 120 Allied ships, while only losing 12 German subs. To make matters worse, Germany was about to introduce a new kind of U-boat, one that would deal a deadly blow to the British, American, and Canadian forces. Hi, and welcome to Curious Minds. I'm Shoshi Shmulevets. This week's episode, U-Boats and the Battle for the Atlantic Ocean, Part 2, Electro boots. This episode is sponsored by Augury. Augury. Machines talk. We listen. Augury's technology is called predictive maintenance. It's built upon a simple principle. Every mechanical system produces unique sounds and noises. By attaching sensors to machines, Augury software can analyze subtle changes in these sounds and diagnose and predict future malfunctions before they occur. This analysis is done in real time using a smartphone. Augury is growing and looking for great engineers and developers who share their same passion and creativity for smart technologies. Has anyone ever told you that you're the smartest person they know? If so, Augury wants to get to know you. Visit cmpod.net and click Augury's banner to submit your resume for positions in New York or in Haifa, Israel. The Germans used a number of different submarine models during the war, and the main one was Type 7. It was considered the workhorse of the fleet and carried out most of the patrols and attacks. Type 7 subs were considered top quality and reliable, but they had one major drawback, their speed. On the surface, they traveled at 17 knots, or about 20 miles per hour, comparable to the speed of the average battleship. But underwater, their maximum speed was only 7 knots, meaning that if after being spotted by an enemy ship, the U-boat dove to make its escape below the surface, it couldn't get away fast enough to avoid the risk of being hit by depth charges. The U-boat's engine was to blame for being so slow underwater. The main engine was a powerful diesel, but since diesel fuel requires oxygen, it could only be used on the surface. When submerged, the U-boat was powered by an electric motor with relatively weak batteries, and that slowed it down. Before the war, Carl Dunitz had been contacted by a scientist named Helmut Walter. Walter had invented an engine that did not require oxygen. The key to this innovation was a liquid called perhydrol, or hydrogen peroxide. Each molecule of peroxide contains two atoms of hydrogen and two atoms of oxygen. A special system separated the peroxide into water and pure oxygen and injected the oxygen into the diesel engine, thereby generating combustion. A submarine equipped with Walter's engine could remain submerged for a very long time, with no need to surface. In order to take full advantage of the engine's capability, Professor Walter designed a new body for the U-boats. The existing hulls were V-shaped, similar to those of surface ships. This gave the U-boats improved stability on the surface. 
at the expense of increased friction, which slowed down the submarine. Walter replaced the V-shaped hull with an elliptical, tear-shaped body that created less friction with the water. Walter's calculations showed that the combination of a powerful engine and reduced friction would enable the sub to travel underwater at a speed of almost 30 knots. This was faster than any vessel in the Allied navies. In fact, Walter's new design was so effective that after the war, it was adopted by the Americans and successfully integrated into their nuclear submarine program. Carl Dunitz was greatly impressed by Walter's invention and approved the continued development of the concept. But for the first two years of the war, this development was painfully slow. On paper, an engine powered by peroxide was a good idea. But when the engineers tried to implement it, they encountered many, many difficulties. For one, peroxide was found to accelerate corrosion in the fuel pipes. For another thing, peroxide fuel was really dangerous. If there was a sharp bend in a pipe, the increased pressure generated at that bend sometimes caused spontaneous combustion of the peroxide. This phenomenon forced the engineers to redesign the fuel system of the entire submarine. The Germans realized that it would take years to resolve all the technical difficulties. So, in December 1943, Dunitz convened his high command to determine the future of the new submarine. Their prediction for how long it would take to complete the development was not encouraging, and the project seemed to be in danger of cancellation. However, two engineers who were taking part in the discussions proposed a surprising idea. In order to increase the distance it could travel without refueling, Professor Walter's new submarine had to be equipped with an especially large fuel tank intended to hold the peroxide. The two engineers suggested removing the peroxide engine and its fuel tank and, in their place, installing two regular engines, one an air-based diesel engine and the other electric. The space that the peroxide engine had occupied would be filled with batteries for the electric engine. The significant boost provided by the batteries would greatly increase the power of the electric engine. The anticipated speed underwater would be 18 knots certainly less than the speed provided by Professor Walter's engine, but still more than twice the speed of the Type 7 U-boat. And most importantly, the new design was based on existing engines and proven technology, so its development could be completed in a few months instead of a few years. Carl Dunitz realized that this breakthrough could determine the outcome of the war. Such a fast submarine would be able to attack its target at very close range and then dive and speed away before the enemy ships had time to launch a counterattack. The U-boat's high speed would also enable them to patrol vast areas of the ocean and locate more convoys. These new, highly innovated submarines would be able to impose a naval blockade on Great Britain and cut off its supply of raw materials and bring its armaments industries to a standstill. As the engineers predicted, within only six months, the development process was complete. And in June 1943, Hitler approved the production of the new U-boats, Type 21, or Electroboots. While the new submarines were becoming a reality, the Allies again seemed to be winning the war. On October 30th, 1942, a British patrol plane spotted submarine U-559 in the east basin of the Mediterranean, about 90 miles north of Egypt. A number of destroyers attacked it, causing serious damage and forcing its crew to abandon ship. Three British sailors rushed to enter it before it sank and managed to salvage an Enigma device and secret codes. Two of the British sailors went down with the sub, but their sacrifice was not in vain. With the device and codes, the intelligence team at Bletchley Park was again able to break the Nazi communication code. And the supply convoys once again eluded the German U-boats that lay in ambush for them. 
At the same time, the Allied warships that escorted convoys were equipped with a new weapon that was more effective than depth charges, the Hedgehog Anti-Submarine Mortar, which fired barrages of a few dozen mortars from the front of the ship. These mortars fell down toward the sea bottom like lethal rain that detonated upon contact with the body of a submarine. The chances of making a direct hit on a U-boat were small, but the enormous number of mortars made them a serious threat to the Germans. But out of all of the technological innovations adopted by the British and Americans during 1943, there were three that had a crucial effect on the course of the war. These were the Huffduff, radar, and aircraft capable of long-distance flight. Each of these was revolutionary in itself. In combination, they were lethal. Let's start with the Huffduff. It might sound like a good name for a child's toy, but it actually gave the submarine's commanders a big headache. The High Frequency Direction Finder, HFDF, nicknamed the Huffduff, was used to detect the exact location of a submarine by listening in on its radio transmissions. It was based on the fact that radio waves, like the ones submarines use to communicate with shore, spread out in all directions, like the concentric circles of ripples when a rock falls in a lake. Imagine standing on the shore of a lake and watching such ripples. It's easy enough to see the general direction that they're coming from, but it's a lot harder to determine the distance they have traveled or the exact point of origin. Were they created by a large boulder that fell far from the shore or by a pebble that landed a short distance away? Radio waves behave in much the same way. So when a submarine sent out a radio transmission, the Allied receiver could detect the general direction the transmission was coming from, but not how far away the submarine actually was. But if you have two direction finders, each in a different position, that's a different situation. Each finder will discover the direction of the antenna, i.e. of the submarine sending out the signal. And the point where these two paths intersect provides a good estimate of the location of the sub. That was the role of the Huffduff, and it could figure out the submarine's location quite accurately. At the end of 1942, the Allies installed Huffduff finders on numerous warships and thus enjoyed a distinct advantage over the Germans. In order to successfully carry out a wolf pack attack, the submarines had to synchronize their arrival at the combat arena at the exact right moment. That kind of coordination required a great deal of communication. Even if the wireless communications were encrypted, Allied ships could still identify the source of the broadcast. And that was enough to allow them to attack the U-boats before it was too late. The second innovation was the radar. The Germans knew the Allies had radar, but the first radar systems that the British installed on their ships weren't particularly effective. They could only detect a submarine when it was on the surface and no more than a few miles away, and then only under ideal conditions. The Germans even developed a device that could recognize radar transmissions, allowing the U-boats to identify the approaching threat in time to dive to safety. But in 1942, the British and the Americans began using a new kind of radar that transmitted radio waves at higher frequencies than were used in earlier designs. This new radar was not only more efficient and powerful than its predecessors, it was also invisible to the German devices. The third innovation was a new aircraft, the B-24 Liberator. America's industrial capabilities were a matter of great concern to the Germans, and rightly so. The production of the Liberator clearly demonstrated the power of America's enormous and efficient industrial factories. Roughly 18,000 aircraft came off the assembly line during the war. That's more than any other aircraft in history. At the height of production, the U.S. turned out a new plane every 55 minutes. The output of aircraft fuselages at a single Ford Motors plant in Detroit was greater than the output of Japan's entire aircraft industry and about half the production of all of Germany's aircraft facilities. The big blockish Liberator wasn't much to look at, but 
it could fly long distances carrying an impressive payload. The British quickly used it to close the air gap in the mid-Atlantic, the area in which Allied ships had been most vulnerable without any support from patrol planes and where the German U-boats had hit them the hardest. Some Germans were concerned that the Allies might succeed in installing radar systems on their planes. But German scientists dismissed those fears, believing that the existing radar systems were too heavy and cumbersome for an aircraft to carry. But they were proven wrong. The German experts had based their assumptions on their own development attempts. But they were far behind the British, who, even before the war, had placed the highest priority on the development of radar technology. Beginning in March 1943, the Liberator aircraft were equipped with radar, and the combination of a long-distance patrol plane, massive armaments, and the ability to locate submarines both during the day and at night turned out to be a deadly combination for the German submarine fleet. As mentioned before, March 1943 was the most successful month for the submarines. But within just two months, thanks to the Liberator, the Huffduff, and Radar, the tables had turned. 41 German subs, close to a fourth of the entire active flotilla of U-boats, were destroyed during Black May. The Bay of Biscay, whose shores had given the German fleet an enormous advantage over the Allies earlier in the war, had become known as the Valley of Death. Many of the U-boats were destroyed in the bay before even making it to the ocean. Peter Dunitz, the son of the Admiral, served on one of those sunken subs. When spotting an incoming aircraft, the accepted procedure among the submarine commanders was to quickly dive and leave the area. This tactic allowed the sub to escape from the plane, but also forced it to lose contact with the convoy it had been lying in wait for. Carl Dunitz believed that the U-boats could and should engage enemy aircraft in combat. On May 1st, Dunitz issued an order. Instead of evading an approaching aircraft, U-boats should fire the cannons on their deck and try to shoot it down. It would soon become clear how damaging Dunitz's order was. Although the German U-boats were equipped with modern, effective cannons and had managed to shoot down more than one Allied plane, Dunitz hadn't taken into account one simple fact. The British were more than happy to trade an airplane for a U-boat. The British had a few thousand patrol aircraft. The Germans had only a few hundred U-boats. The fight back order remained in effect for only 97 days before being revoked. In that time, the patrol planes managed to sink 20 German subs and to seriously damage 17 more at the cost of only 120 planes. Black May had been a sign of things to come. From that moment on, the German naval forces gradually lost their offensive momentum, and the number of ships the U-boats managed to sink decreased each month. Karl Dunitz realized that things were looking grim, but he did his best to boost morale. He promised the crews that a revolutionary technology would soon transform the combat environment to their advantage. But the Type 21 submarine was still in its initial stages of production and the German engineers still hadn't managed to make improvements to the existing subs and their equipment. The Germans did introduce two major improvements at the end of 1943. The first was the acoustic torpedo, which homed in on its target by heading for the noise made by the ship's propellers turning in the water. Previously existing torpedoes were dumb in the sense that they traveled only in a straight line or along a predefined route. But the acoustic torpedo could steer itself along the way, thereby increasing its chances of hitting the target. The second innovation was an idea that the Germans stole from the Dutch. When Germany occupied Holland in 1940, they captured two Dutch submarines. German engineers discovered that Holland had implemented a new concept, a collapsible pipe that allowed the sub to suck in air for its diesel engine even while diving at a depth of a few feet. 
The sound the air pipe made while the engine was running sounded to the Germans like snoring, schnarchen in German. So they called the pipe the schnorchel or snorkel. The Dutch idea had a certain logic. Since only the upper end of the pipe stuck out above the surface, the danger of discovery was much lower than when the whole sub surfaced. Even so, the Germans weren't particularly impressed by the snorkel. As we know, German submarines were designed to spend most of their time on the surface. Diving, in the minds of the German engineers, was mainly for escaping from attack. Therefore, the U-boats were not intended to spend long days underwater, but only a few hours at a time. The batteries that powered the electric engine were a fitting solution for such short periods of time, and there was no need for the noisy snorkel. But by mid-1943, the German subs were forced to spend more and more time underwater while trying to evade Allied patrol aircraft. And that's when they remembered the snorkel and began installing them on their U-boats. The snorkel gave the submarine a small advantage in that the British and American radar wasn't able to detect the narrow pipe amidst the waves, so the U-boat could sneak up close to its target. But it also had disadvantages. For example, a submarine with the pipe up couldn't go very fast without the thin pipe bending and breaking from the water pressure. Using the noisy snorkel to go faster would also have made the sub's sensitive sonar almost useless. During the first months that the snorkel was in use, it suffered from very low reliability, especially with the valve that was installed on the upper end of the pipe to prevent water from getting into the engine. Whenever this valve malfunctioned and the supply of outside air was cut off, the diesel engine would suck air from the only available source which was the air inside the sub. The air pressure inside the U-boat would suddenly drop, leaving the crew writhing on the floor, suffering from intolerable earaches and punctured eardrums. The acoustic torpedo also failed to live up to expectations and only managed to home in on extremely loud targets. It missed ships traveling at a relatively slow speed, such as merchant ships, that were the main targets. In at least two instances, submarines sank themselves. The torpedoes they launched locked onto the noise made by the submarine itself and made a U-turn. The Allies also learned to employ an anti-submarine countermeasure, a device for ships to drag in their wake, making a great deal of noise and rendering the torpedoes even less effective. CM Pod is proudly sponsored by Outbrain. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably used Outbrain today. You just didn't realize it until now. Outbrain is the service that recommends which stories to check out next when you're browsing your favorite sites. Didn't know there was a service for that? Ever wondered why you see the stories that you see on sites like CNN, ESPN, and People Magazine? It's because Outbrain uses algorithms to figure out what you might like to see next based on your interests and other readers like you. So, the next time you reach the end of a story on your favorite site and you're thinking about what's next, remember, Outbrain thinks of that for you. Outbrain. We could all use a little direction. Visit Outbrain.com for more info. The U-boat's crews were still eager to fight. They were mostly young men who had come of age in the Nazi school system and believed with all their hearts in the Nazis' vision of Aryan victory. But blind faith is no substitute for practical capability. The flotilla of German U-boats entered 1944 in a sorry state. And the results of the Allies' technological superiority were unmistakable. During 1944, the U-boat sang 120 merchant ships at the incomprehensible cost of 130 submarines. The casualty rate among the submarine crews was 75%. That means three of every four sailors who went out to sea didn't return. This was the highest casualty rate in any branch of the German armed forces on all fronts. 
Before going to sea on a U-boat, sailors said their goodbyes to family and friends as if they were going toward certain death. The submarines gained a dubious reputation as floating coffins. The German command was under a great deal of pressure, but the Type 21 model, the new fast submarine they were all praying would lift them out of the deep hole they were in, still wasn't ready. The shipyard schedules showed that the first sub of the new model would be completed only in November of 1945 and wouldn't enter active service until mid-1946. For the Germans, this schedule was unacceptable. The Navy command contacted a German industrialist named Otto Merker, who had extensive experience in the mass production of automobiles. They asked him to help accelerate the production of the new submarine. Merker studied the existing process to identify the major problems. All the shipyards producing the sub worked in serial. That means each manufactured one part after the other and then assembled them into a single U-boat. This serial process severely slowed the production. No part was made until the previous part had been completed, and thus it took a year and a half to complete a single submarine. Merker urged the shipyards to change the entire process. Instead of making the parts one after the other in the same factory, each factory should specialize in making one component of the sub so that all the factories would work in parallel. Thus, Merker managed to shorten the production time per sub to only six months. And by the beginning of 1945, the first Type 21 U-boats rolled off the assembly line. The first operational Type 21 U-boat was the U-2511, under the command of Adelbert Schnee, a highly experienced officer. On April 3rd, 1945, U-2511 left the port of Bergen in Norway and headed for the Caribbean islands to take part in its first patrol mission. It was spotted by British warships, but as its designers had predicted, it used the advantage of its underwater speed to easily escape the ships and their depth charges. Four days later, on the 4th of May, the submarine spotted British destroyer HMS Norfolk. Edelbert Schnee believed in the combat potential of the vessel under his command and decided to put it to the test. He dove underwater, quickly and quietly slithered between the destroyer's detection and defensive measures, and positioned his U-boat at a distance of 1,500 feet from its target a perfect textbook position for attack from which the destroyer had no chance of escaping. Schnee held fire. In his hands, he was holding a message that had arrived just a few hours before. The order for the German armed forces to surrender. Having proven the indisputable technological superiority of his U-boat, he ordered the crew to turn around and return to Bergen where he surrendered to Allied forces. A few days later, the submarine commander happened to meet Allied officers from the Norfolk and told them about their encounter at sea. At first, the destroyer's officers refused to believe that a submarine had managed to get that close undetected. But they were convinced once he showed them two entries from the log of the U-2511. Carl Dunitz, like many other military commanders and senior government officials, knew that the war was lost and German surrender was only a matter of time. One can assume that the news of Hitler's suicide in his bunker in Berlin didn't come as a big surprise to them. The real surprise was in store for him a few days later, when he learned of the contents of the Fuhrer's will. Hitler had appointed him, Admiral Karl Dunitz, as his successor. No one, including Dunitz, had expected that dramatic choice. Hitler, on the verge of total defeat and overwhelmed by paranoia, had decided that the Nazi higher-ups like Hermann Goering and Heinrich Himmler, the more obvious choices, they'd betrayed him, turned their backs on him in his most desperate moment, and so he decided to anoint the ever-loyal Dunitz as the Third Reich's new president and supreme commander of the armed forces. 
Dönitz received the news of his appointment while at a naval base in northern Germany. The next day, after fleeing from the disintegrating city of Berlin, Heinrich Himmler strode into Dönitz's office, escorted by six SS officers. In his memoir, the admiral described this tense encounter as follows. I offered Himmler a chair and sat down at my desk, on which lay, hidden by some papers, a pistol with the safety catch off. I had never done anything of this sort in my life before, but I did not know what the outcome of this meeting might be. I handed Himmler the telegram containing my appointment. Please read this, I said. I watched him closely. As he read, an expression of astonishment, indeed of consternation, spread over his face. All hope seemed to collapse within him. He went very pale. Finally, he stood up and bowed. Allow me, he said, to become the second man in your state. I replied that was out of the question and that there was no way I could make any use of his services. Thus advised, he left me at about one o'clock in the morning. The showdown had taken place without force, and I felt relieved. A few days later, Himmler was captured by the British and committed suicide by poisoning. Dunitz, on the other hand, harbored no thoughts of suicide. He had a most important mission, to organize the quick and orderly surrender of all the German armed forces as soon as possible because every additional death would serve no purpose. His first goal was to transfer as many German soldiers as possible to the Western Front, thus allowing them to surrender to the British and Americans. The Germans had killed approximately 20 million Russian soldiers and civilians during the failed invasion of the USSR, and their countrymen did not tend to be merciful to the POWs, if they even took any prisoners, that is. On the 8th of May, 1945, Dunitz ordered the military high command to sign the armistice agreement and the war officially came to an end. The Allies captured about 150 of the once dreaded German U-boats. Most of them were sunk in the years following the war, though a few remain on display in museums around the world. Karl Dunitz was among the accused at the Nuremberg trials and was found guilty of war crimes. However, since he had not been personally involved in the Holocaust or other atrocities, he was sentenced to only 10 years imprisonment. He was released in 1956 and spent the rest of his life in a country home in West Germany. He wrote two autobiographies about the war and never expressed any remorse for the important part that he'd played in the brutal Nazi war machine or for the 30,000 Allied soldiers and civilians that were killed by his submarine attacks. He saw himself as a loyal soldier and German patriot who had followed orders in the same way that the British, American, and Russian generals had followed theirs. He died in 1980. So we have seen that the Germans didn't lose the war because of cowardice or poor leadership, but mainly because they lost the technological arms race. But despite their defeat in the war, the knowledge and experience their engineers gained while designing and producing the advanced submarine didn't just evaporate. During the 1950s, as part of the economic recovery of West Germany, the Allied powers allowed them to develop submarines for export, as long as their weight was less than 450 tons meaning relatively small subs. The Germans salvaged a number of subs from the sea bottom and refurbished them. Later, they also began to export completely new models that were tiny compared to Russian and American nuclear subs, but were quiet and equipped with sophisticated technology. Eventually, that became one of Germany's most important exports. Now, here's an interesting and little-known anecdote. One of the first submarine models that German shipyards developed in the 1960s was Type 206. The Israeli Navy, which at the time was considering a number of Danish and Italian models, decided that the German sub was the best option for them. An agreement between Israel and Germany was signed, but for clearly political reasons, it was decided that they would be produced in Britain rather than Germany. 
the name of the model was changed to Gal, and it successfully served the Israeli Navy for many, many years. The next model the Germans developed, Type 209, is the most commercially successful in the world. 14 navies have purchased these subs, including the Israeli Navy. These are the Dolphin submarines, the most expensive armament purchased by the IDF. In this case as well, the difficult history between the two nations affected the deal, this time in Israel's favor. The Germans financed most of the cost of the production of the expensive submarines. So it happened that the state of Israel, home to the Jewish people whom the Nazis tried to exterminate, was among those who profited most from the success of the German submarine flotilla, which was a great source of pride to Adolf Hitler. Fate, it seems, doesn't lack a sense of irony. That's all for this episode of Curious Minds. Visit our website, www.cmpod.net, for a complete archive of past episodes, as well as the forum, RSS feed, and links to all the social networks. Subscribe to the show on iTunes or almost every other podcasting app on Android or iPhone. You can also subscribe to our mailing list and get an update each and every time a new episode is available. We would love to hear your feedback and ideas for future episodes. Let us know what you think at info at cmpod.net. If you're an advertiser interested in learning more about the podcast and becoming a sponsor, contact us at info at cmpod.net. Curious Minds is written and produced by Ron Levy, hosted by me, Shoshi Shmulevitz, and Kelly O'Loughlin. Technical production by Alex Benish, Nir Sayag is the sound editor, and Donnie T. Moore is our business manager. This episode was recorded at TLV1 Studios in Tel Aviv. Thanks for listening, and see you again in a couple of weeks. Bye! The Germans used... <laughs> Electro boots. <laughs> Maybe drop in some EDM there, some electronic dance music. <laughs> German uh, Electro boots. Unza, 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 unza. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know people. People also tend, yeah. People tend to get a little bit upset when you uh, joke about, like, you know, World War Two. <laughs> Maybe, maybe just do a whole episode about flatulence. Historic. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs>